Welcome Facebook users and thank you for joining us this evening for our TIFF Talk. I'm Andrea Millers with Endogastric Solutions and today we have a very special Dr. Patel. Welcome Dr. Patel and thank you for being here today. Thanks Andrea, appreciate it. So let me give you a little bit of background on Dr. Patel. He is a certified gastroenterologist and hepatology or certified in gastro gastroenterology and also hepatology. Certified. I, certified. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> um, throughout his medical training and beyond, Dr. Patel has remained active in clinical research, which has resulted in several publications and presentations at national meetings. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Patel currently serves as Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Amida St. Francis Hospital in Evanston, Illinois, and was the first to perform TIF at Amida St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. So again, good to have you here, Dr. Patel, and thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate that introduction. Awesome. So um, for all of you that are joining us this evening, as you all know, this is a live event. And at any time you have any questions for Dr. Patel, um, please feel free to type it into the comment section and we will do our best to answer any and all of your questions tonight. So um, we're going to go ahead and start the program. And Dr. Patel, tell us a little bit more about your practice and where you are located right now. Sure. Um, I practice uh, out of uh, Amida St. Francis, as you mentioned, uh, which is in Evanston, uh, Illinois, as well as Amida St. Joseph, which is in Chicago. Um, and so they're both community hospitals. Um, yeah. Fantastic. So let's talk a little bit more about GERD. Can you kind of give us a scientific ex explanation of what is GERD and what could patients potentially feel um, or experience if they are suffering from GERD or chronic acid reflux? Absolutely. Um, so with GERD or G-E-R-D, I'm going to take the first three letters to start the explanation, which is gastroesophageal reflux. So that's basically when you have a reflux of your stomach contents into your esophagus. And then the disease part of gastroesophageal reflux disease comes in when the reflux of those stomach contents in your esophagus actually causes symptoms or complications. And complications include esophagitis, strictures, Barrett's esophagus, which can potentially turn to cancer. And then with symptoms, you can divide them into atypical symptoms and typical symptoms. The typical symptoms are heartburn, regurgitation. Atypical symptoms, um, a lot of patients will see the GI doctor, but they also may see other doctors, like their lung doctor, because they may experience um, a cough, um, they may have asthma, pharyngitis, uh, sleep apnea, um, as well as uh, pneumonia and, and other conditions like pulmonary fibrosis. They may also see their ENT doctor because they may have recurrent ear infections, um, as well as sinus infections, um, hoarseness of their voice, um, and then sometimes they even see their dentist because they have dental erosions. And then uh, lastly, uh, they may see a cardiologist because of chest pain. So given the fact that you have all these different manifestations of, of GERD, uh, right? That, that's the condition, but there's so many different manifestations. It's no surprise that um, GERD is actually the number one most commonly you know, diagnosed conditions as far as GI-related illnesses by physicians in the US. Um, and uh, in fact, I think 60 million or roughly 20% of the U.S. population experiences GERD on a monthly basis and 15 million uh, Americans experience it on a daily basis. So it's increasingly, uh, you know, becoming more prevalent, especially with the, the rates of obesity rising. Um, so very, very uh, common uh, disease that we as gastroenterologists see almost on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, that was a really good explanation. Um, and, and oftentimes, um, I, I hear about patients going into emergency rooms thinking that they're having a heart attack and, and they come to find out they only need, not, not that they only have GERD, we don't want to trivialize GERD, but, but it ends up being GERD related, right? So, um, and then the other thing too that is interesting is um, patients always wonder is when do I go seek a doctor, right? Because every now and then they'll eat something um, that causes acid reflux. And if, if it's like how often, at what point do these patients 
need to come and, and get checked by a gastroenterologist or a physician um, to determine is this more than just you know normal acid reflux or is it something more um, more intense, if you will? Yeah, I think the bottom line is if they if it's affecting their quality of life, then I think it's time to see a doctor, right? So if it's once a month, it doesn't really bother them probably no big deal. But if it's happening every day or, you know, several times a week even, um, then they're probably going to go see their family doctor first. And then their family doctor will, will oftentimes refer them to the GI doctor if kind of first line therapies are not effective. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about managing GERD. Um, as a gastroenterologist, you normally, um, initially, if you will, tell patients to do um, to manage their GERD, for example, you know, are there, do they need to uh, avert certain foods that they're eating? Are there certain lifestyle modifications? You talked a little bit about obesity. Do they need to change um, their diet or need to lose weight? What are certain things they can do to help manage their GERD? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think you, you hit on some of these uh, really important points, the lifestyle changes. So uh, I think weight management is really key. Um, you know, there's been a prospective study that was done that showed that um, it, all the participants in the study, if they actually completed the weight loss program, 81% of them had a reduction of their symptoms and 65% had complete resolution of their symptoms. So weight loss is incredibly effective. Um, and so that, that's the, the first thing. And then um, the other things that have been proven to actually reduce acid reflux is when you eat a large meal, um, what, I mean, you should kind of aim to eat a smaller meals because the larger the meal, the more acid gets released uh, to digest that meal. And then there, there's a potential of that acid then coming up and refluxing into your esophagus. And then when you do eat, you want to make sure you wait at least two to three hours before you lie down. That just gives the stomach the chance to empty itself. And when you lie down, don't lie down flat. Elevate the head of the bed up at least six inches to have gravity kind of keep that acid down. And I, I recommend not to use pillows because they kind of just flatten out. Like maybe get a wedge pillow, something that's firm so that you can you know keep that um, elevation. And um, if you don't have a wet pillow, then just you use kind of blocks or books to kind of prop up the head of the bed up. So that's the initial. Um, and then beyond that, um, we would talk about medications. Um, and I, I can go into that if you want. Yeah, please do. Let's talk about medications because that was the next question I was going to ask you. What's the next step after those kind of lifestyle modifications or food modifications that they need to make? Yeah. Yeah, so um, by that, that's probably the time that, you know, a lot of patients come to, to see a GI doctor. And um, so at, at, when I see them initially, I want to make sure that they are definitely, you know, doing those lifestyle changes. And, and if they're still having symptoms, uh, then I really pay attention to those symptoms. I mean, we outlined earlier the typical and the atypical symptoms. Um, but there's also alarm symptoms. Um, and as a gastroenterologist, that's what I'm paying attention to um, initially. And so those symptoms include trouble swallowing, um, weight loss that's unintentional. They get early satiety, which is where they, they get full easily after eating. Um, they can also you know, present with uh, vomiting and, and throwing up blood sometimes, um, anemia. So um, all those things are what we call alarm symptoms. And if I hear those things, then we're going to go straight to an upper endoscopy to put a scope down into their uh, stomach and take a look to see what's going on. Um, but if they don't have those alarm symptoms, and many don't, um, then we will, you know, try to put them on drugs um, like proton pump inhibitors um, or H2 receptor antagonist. Um, and uh, with the proton pump inhibitors, um, I, I like to, you know, start off um, usually at a, at a lower dose. And then if it works, then great. If it doesn't, then we'll kind of adjust the dose. But once you find the dose that works, the aim is always to use the lowest effective dose for the shortest duration of time. Um, that's, that's the key. And, and, and if it, you know, works and the re symptoms are resolved, then stop it. And if they come back, then resume it at that lowest effective dose. And again, the aim is just to use it as needed uh, in, the, in the end. Now, in the scenario where you put them on PPIs and they are not, you know, responding, I think the first thing you want to do is make sure they're taking it appropriately. Because so many patients are not taking it appropriately. 
in fact, there was a study done that showed that 50% of the time, patients are actually not taking it right. And so you really want to emphasize uh, in your initial you know, conversations with your patients that you have to take PPIs 30 minutes prior to meals. Um, and the reason why that's so important is that it actually blocks acid pumps in the stomach. And so the acid pumps are only activated when you eat. And so it's really important to take it then 30 minutes before you eat. Um, and, and so once you know, you've checked that they're taking it appropriately um, and they're still not responding, then what you could do is um, split the dose of their drug um, and so that you take half of it in the morning, half of it in, in the evening. Um, that's, that's an option or switch them to a different uh, type of, uh, you know, drug as well. Um, and, and then after that, if they're not responding, then I would definitely do an upper endoscopy. Um, and I would make sure that you add a pH monitor. Uh, I think that's so important. I've been doing that a lot more recently um, as a way to kind of personalize uh, the treatment plan to the patient. I think it's so important to do that because if you don't do that, what ends up happening is that these patients are on PPIs for so many years. And I think it actually is cost effective. If you, if you get a personalized treatment plan initially, yes, initially, you know, you have to do the upper endoscopy and, and the pH monitor and that, that has a cost to it. At, at year one, that cost is actually neutral. And then beyond that year, you actually save money because you haven't kept this patient on so many years of, you know, PPIs and that can have some, you know, consequences. But once, let's say you do the upper endoscopy and uh, you do the pH monitoring. If it shows that they have acid reflux, then you want to treat them accordingly um, by optimizing their medications or anti-reflux procedures, which I'm sure we'll talk about in just a bit. And then if they don't have acid reflux, that's good to know because then you don't have to keep them on these medications forever, right? And you can make that change early on. And they more than likely have functional heartburn um, at that point, or they could have bile reflux or non-acid reflux. And functional heartburn is essentially visceral hypersensitivity and, and the way to explain that is you know you they, they've done a study where they did uh, you know 100 patients that had acid reflux and 100 normal controls and they found that those that complained of acid reflux and that those that were normal actually had the same amount of acid coming up so some people just tend to feel it more than others you know and and I think it's a it's one of those things where um, you know you're, I don't know if you're wearing a watch right now, but <laughs> it, there you go. <laughs> Got your Apple watch on. Yes. Um, it's so, you know, if I didn't ask you about that, I don't know if you would have known that you were wearing a watch, right? Because your brain is constantly turning off that signal, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens in some people is that acid is coming up and most of us that, all of us have reflux that comes up, but we don't sense it because our brain is constantly, you know, suppressing that signal. But in some people, they actually, the brain doesn't do that and they, they sense it, you know? Um, and so then there's things called neuromodulators that uh, we can prescribe to our patients um, that can raise the threshold so that they don't experience that pain um, or, or, you know, are so sensitive to it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting stuff because, you know, it gets me excited because when you have a treatment plan like I just outlined, then you know exactly what to do in each scenario and you don't keep patients unnecessarily on medications that they don't have to be on because there's long-term consequences of these. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I love that explanation. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we've ever had any physician explain it in that in that sense. So it's it's really nice, A, for me to hear and then also I'm sure that people um, appreciate it as well. We actually have a lot of questions that have already popped up. So um, before we go on, I'm going to uh, try to get through some of these so um, we can get them answered. Sure. Uh, let me get to the top up here. Okay, so Andrew is asking, what's the advantage of a TIF with hiatal hernia repair for making my reflux better? So maybe this is a good segue to start talking about um, the TIF. Well, actually, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about the TIF procedure now. Um, we can go ahead and answer that question, and then maybe we'll talk about other treatment options as well. Sure. Um, so, so TIF procedure or transoral incisionless fundoplication is uh, essentially a, a procedure where um, we are able to um, narrow the open opening from your esophagus to your stomach um, and kind of lengthen that valve um, and 
the advantage of this procedure is that it's not taking any other surgeries that you may need, um, you know, off the table. Um, so it's kind of a, a bridge between medications and kind of traditional surgery. Um, and w in particular to Andrew's question, um, a lot of patients have a hiatal hernia. What is a hiatal hernia? A hiatal hernia is, um, well, basically there's a, di a muscle called the diaphragm and that's uh, kind of this tented muscle that separates your chest cavity from your abdominal cavity. And uh, in that diaphragm, there's a hole, uh, there's two holes, one for the aorta and one for the esophagus. And what happens with a hiatal hernia is that the stomach or part of the stomach can go up into that chest cavity through that hole or hiatus. Um, and, and that, when it, that happens, that can cause discomfort as well as heart uh, for, for patients. So it, it's really important when you have that hiatal hernia that you get that hiatal hernia fixed. And, and then at the same time, they can do the wrap procedure or the TIF procedure. And if you just do one, it's, you're only attacking 50% of it. You're, the, uh, the benefit or the efficacy is only 50%. You really should do both, especially if it's a large hiatal hernia more than two centimeters. If it's a hiatal hernia less than two centimeters, it actually automatically gets repaired if you do the TIF. Um, and that basically is done all with a the scope. Uh, there's no incisions on the outside, inside. Um, there's no scars. And basically just take the scope, pull the esophagus down, and wrap um, the stomach around the esophagus partially, and then we put in these fasteners in place to kind of hold it. So. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, so let's answer a couple more questions. When is it time to consider uh, discontinuing my PPIs and have an anti-reflux procedure? Um, when you get that EGDH study, right? So if you get that and it shows that you do not have acid reflux, you don't, your, your pH is above four, then your issue is not acid reflux. It could be functional heart. Um, you know, or if you do have acid reflux, maybe you're refractory to PPIs. Um, you know, actually, 5% um, of all Caucasians are hypermetabolizers of PPIs. So some patients just will, PPIs won't be as effective. And so um, that's when anti reflux surgery would be a good option for those individuals. Okay. So this is going back to kind of um, PPIs and long-term side effects, or could PPIs be, you know, either harmful, either harmful for me um, in the future or long-term. But this question is, um, am I at a higher risk to get COVID if I take twice daily PPIs? Kind of like the elephant in the room right now, right? Um, yeah. With COVID. So I know that there was a study that just came out uh, recently, or there was an article that came out on time about PPIs and COVID risk. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that's a, uh, obviously a pertinent question. Um, that's on a lot of my patients' minds. And uh, there was a study that came out earlier this year. Um, now, this was a study that was a prospective, which is a good thing, um, study that was, but it was an observational study. So when it's an observational study, the best you can do is make a association between two things. You cannot prove causality that one thing caused another. So th this study um, actually was done, uh, it was more of a kind of a survey, um, I think with over 3,000 patients. And uh, what they found essentially was that those individuals that took PPI twice a day had a 3.7% increased risk of getting COVID. And those that took PPIs once a day had a 2.2% uh, increased risk uh, of, of getting COVID. And interestingly enough, those that took the histamine receptor antagonist did not have an elevated risk at all. And that was kind of fascinating. And there was a, a different study uh, altogether that actually looked at famotidine um, in the hospital setting and mortality. And I thought that was kind of uh, fascinating. They actually showed that those that were on famotidine in the hospital um, with COVID ended up doing better than those that were not on COVID. And the reason could be that they inhibit histamine. Um, and 
when you learn about COVID, what ends up happening is there's this thing called a cytokine, cytokine storm. Basically, a whole bunch of inflammatory markers get released, and that can result in um, hypoxia, difficulty breathing, organ failure, uh, sepsis, death. Um, and so it's all started by this cytokine, cytokine storm. And so with famotidine, it inhibits histamine, and therefore it could potentially inhibit that cytokine storm. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of interesting data coming out uh, as it relates to PPIs and histamine blockers. Yeah, yeah, wow. God, you could talk about that all day, and I'm yeah. just, that's so intriguing. Yeah, uh, okay. um, I, one last point I wanted to make yeah. with that is, is the bottom line, I think, with a lot of these, you know, studies, as well as kind of just all the things you hear about long-term PPI use, uh, is that I think, you know, when you're de when you're thinking about it, you want to make sure that you're using the PPIs appropriately. I think we're using them too much, and and then we're keeping them on for too long. So you want to use them in the right patients that need it, and that goes back to that kind of personalized approach that we want to talked about earlier. It's just make sure you use it in the individuals that truly need it, and then you don't keep them on it for more than they need to be on it. You know, uh, and I think that's kind of the the big takeaway with a lot of these studies. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about other treatment options. Currently, what are the treatment options? You did talk about uh, the TIF procedure. You know, there's the Nissen. Maybe you can talk about the difference of that on um, any other procedures that are out there currently right now to treat um, acid re or GERD, if you will. Sure. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, certain, and, and that's an interesting point. I mean, in the 1980s is when the histamine receptor blocker actually came out first in 1980, and 1988 is when the PPI came out. When these drugs came out, the shift actually uh, went from doing surgery, which is the Nissen, right? That that's what was initially done. Basically, the Nissen is where they take the stomach and wrap it around the esophagus 360 degrees, and it's very very effective at blocking acid um, from coming from your stomach into your esophagus, but when that wrap is so tight, it can cause problems with swallowing, a lot of gas and bloating and flatulence. Um, and so that can be really kind of uh, painful when, when you know, patients have a hard time belching, it can be really uncomfortable. So that was the, the problem with the, the Nissen uh, fundification. Um, but with the advent of these drugs, um, you know, it shifted uh, from surgery to, to drugs. But now it's interesting because now we have a, a, a swing in the pendulum towards surgery and and the reason for that is one we talked about is that there's uh, long-term consequences potentially to, to PPI use right and then the second is that we've gone from this kind of uh, open surgery like Nissen requiring requiring incisions to minimal incisions and now to no incisions with the right. TIF right yeah. so those two factors have kind of you know um, allowed us to do more uh, surgical interventions, which really addresses how GERD happens in the first place. It, it has a lot to do with um, the visceral hypersensitivity, but also the anatomy uh, and, and physiology. And, and that portion is really addressed by um, these anti-reflex surgeries uh, like Nissen um, and, and TIF. And uh, the other one that a lot of people will talk about is the Lynx procedure. And essentially, that's uh, where they just take a, uh, a magnetic um, bracelet and, and place it around your esophagus. And the idea there is that it will open um, to allow the food to come through from your esophagus into your stomach and then kind of close um, so that it prevents acid from coming back up. Uh, so that is an option. Um, the one thing with that is that there is some suggestion that it can kind of cause erosions. Um, so um, that's just something to, to be aware of. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, let's ask, answer a couple more questions. They're, they're coming in. They're coming in. <laughs> okay, so um, Stephen's asking, I have um, LPR, basically. Is there anything new in the treatment taking omeprazole forever? Or he, It sounds like he's been taking omeprazole forever. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that these options that we're talking about is something that you should consider. Um, you know, in, in PPIs, when you look at how it affects cough and hoarseness of the voice, actually have not been effective um, traditionally. So he's probably suffering because 
if that's the type of symptoms that he has, then it, you know it's probably not doing much for him. But um, otherwise, if it's if it's just reflux that's kind of coming up um, and causing laryngitis, um, and a lot of you know patients have kind of micro aspiration uh, as well, and leading to you know issues with pneumonitis and, and sleep apnea as well, because every time that little bit kind of you know, uh, acid travels up and kind of dips into your vocal cords, it wakes you up. And, and so, um, as I stated earlier, all of these are different manifestations of the same condition of reflux contents uh, from your stomach going up into your uh, esophagus. So, you know, that has to be addressed. Um, if it's an anatomic issue, then the treatment approach is an, an anatomic with surgery. Right. Right. So Chanel is asking, can you get the TIF even if I don't have a hiatal hernia? I have stage three GERD and LPR. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's that's called a straight TIF, um, and basically it, it's uh, done. Probably it takes about thirty to to forty five minutes to do that, um, and you can actually go home the same day potentially, depending on how you do after the procedure. Uh, but absolutely, if you don't have a hiatal hernia, or if you have a hiatal hernia that's small, less than two centimeters, a straight TIF is the way to go. Um, you only do the combination when you have a hiatal hernia that's more than two centimeters. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Karen's asking, Dr. Patel, please talk more slow, uh, slowly when sharing information. <laughs> I guess you're talking really fast. Um, so, so, sorry, I was like, wait, I'm, I'm hoping it's a really interesting question. <laughs> they they want to hear all the uh, all of the um, scientific answers to your question. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so um, so another question: um, if the PPIs aren't working, but I don't want to take them forever. Can I choose to have a TIF instead of being on meds the rest of my life? So, absolutely, yeah. So you, you know, a TIF is a good option when um, you're refractory to PPIs, so they're they're not working as well as you'd like to work, and you have documented acid reflux. I think you know a, a TIF is a great option, but it's also for people um, that just don't want to be on them forever. You know. Right. Um, like the the um, person just asked that, so I think yes, uh, it is a is a valid option if you just because people understand that even if they're effective for them, there potentially could be long term consequences of taking them, and as a result, they don't want to be on it. They don't want to take that risk, and I think surgery is is a fine option for them. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll we'll ask another question and then we'll continue with um, the program. So. How accurate are the tests at a, identifying the size of a hiatal hernia? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, when we do endoscopy, um, sometimes you really got to know, and this is more kind of directed towards GI doctors are actually doing the procedure, but um, you really got to take time and examine for a hiatal hernia when you're doing uh, an upper endoscopy. Um, and it, if you don't do that, it's very easy to kind of miss. Um, so um, that's one way to uh, diagnose a hiatal hernia. But oftentimes, before I schedule a patient for a TIF, um, I will get an esophagram because it will either you know confirm what I saw uh, up with the upper endoscopy, um, you know, or it may tell me a different result. And um, a lot of times, you know, it will confirm it, but it'll it'll actually suggest that the hiatal hernia is much larger than I had anticipated when I did the upper endoscopy. So I think it's a good idea to get, um, and it's very mesophagram is rather non-invasive and, and, and pretty easy to get. So I would recommend that that individuals um, looking to, to get a TIF get that esophagram as well to really accurately uh, identify the hiatal hernia. Perfect. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the TIF procedure and, and um, you talked about how it works. Let's talk about what can a patient expect the day of the procedure. Um, they're going to come in. Um, what, you know, what can they expect when they come in for their TIF procedure? Yeah. Um, so when they come in uh, to the hospital, um, you know, if it's it depends if it's a hiatal hernia or, or a straight TIF, um, but if it's a straight TIF, they will just come into the endoscopy suite and we will um, talk to them in advance and let them know what the 
what we're going to be doing. Uh, there's going to be an anesthesiologist that will put them to sleep. Um, and uh, once that's done, then we'll start uh, the, the procedure and they will not know any of this happened. Um, you know, they'll wake up and they'll be like, all right, when are we getting started? And it's already kind of, you know, been done. Um, and uh, patients tolerate the, the TIF procedure uh, pretty well. Um, you know, you do have the risk of endoscopy that you would have with any procedure, which include infection, bleeding, perforation, less than 1%, 99% safe. Um, a lot of times, though, immediately afterwards, patients will experience uh, substernal kind of discomfort because of the uh, irritation to muscles uh, uh, called the crura. Um, and then sometimes they may even get shoulder pain because uh, of irritation to a nerve called the phrenic nerve that innervates that diaphragm that we talked about earlier. Um, and so for the most part, it's well tolerated. They don't get that swallowing or the gas and bloating and the flatulence that they get with the, the Nissen as much. So that, that's a nice thing. Um, yeah. and, and it's it, and maybe we'll touch upon this later, the effectiveness of TIF. Yeah, yeah. Well, well go ahead. Why don't you talk about the effectiveness of TIF? Yeah, no, there's a, a trial that came out, the Tempo trial, and uh, it actually has five-year data. And so that's, that's pretty uh, incredible in, in the sense that a lot of these other procedures um, haven't been along. Uh, they just haven't made it to five years. So the fact that TIF has been around, I think, since 2007, uh, over 25,000 TIF procedures have been done, right? And so this study uh, looked at five-year data, and they found that um, at, in terms of effectiveness to reduce troublesome regurgitation, at year one, um, it was 88% uh, effective at, at reducing it. At year three, it was 90%. And at year five, it was 86%. And essentially, two out of three patients at the end of five years still remained without daily PPI use. So rather effective. Fantastic. Wonderful. You're getting lots of questions, Dr. Patel. <laughs> this is the most questions I've ever had on a TIF talk. But let's get through some of them. Okay. So my doctor wants to redo my Nissen. Can I get a TIF instead? Um, I don't know if that's possible. So you... They want to, so yes, I, I would say uh, it is possible. It, so sometimes Nissen's will kind of loosen up with time. Um, and it's really, actually, TIF is perfect for that in the sense that um, you can just go in with the scope and tighten it up. Um, and it's actually really easy to do that. Um, so I think instead of getting a, a you know, whole new Nissen where you're, you're surgically kind of, you know, open, uh, it's much easier, I think, to do a TIF just to tighten that up a little bit. So I, th I think TIF's a great option in that situation. Perfect. Uh, Catherine's asking, why do I experience burning sensation in my upper stomach between the middle chest? Um, that just sounds like heartburn uh, to yeah. me. Um, yeah. Just what we described earlier of, of reflex uh, contents uh, from your stomach into your esophagus. Yeah. And Lawrence is asking, how often does TIF eliminate symptoms and the and the and end the need for medication? <laughs> so basically, if you have the TIF, do you still have to take medication? Yeah, and, and we talked about that just a little bit ago. Is that the the Tempo trial um, did reveal that at the end of five years, um, you know, two out of three patients did not need to take daily PPIs. Um, so uh, it, it is effective in that sense, um, but you know that trial also suggested uh, that when you get the TIF done, and and there's you know a fair number of people that got the TIF done and were still taking PPIs, well they had their symptoms completely controlled, whereas before they were taking PPIs, their symptoms were not controlled. But with the TIF and the PPI their symptoms were completely controlled. And so I think even if you have to take PPIs with the TIF, it's not a treatment failure, it's just a concomitant uh, adjunct, you know. Um, so I, I think um, it, it is effective at reducing the need for daily PPIs, but even if you need to use daily PPIs, uh, at least you're getting good symptom control. Yeah, perfect. Let's talk a little bit about kind of post-op um, and what you, generally tell patients, you know, after what's recovery look like, what, um, what does their diet look like? What are the uh, different things that they need to do? Um, be aware of after they have a TIF procedure and or a 
concomitant hiatal hernia to procedure. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit uh, a little while ago about what they're going to experience in terms of their shoulder pain and substernal discomfort. But in terms of um, recovery uh, and their diet and, and physical activity, um, in terms of physical activity, they're going to be off of work generally for, you know, it, I would say at least a week, um, you know, three to seven days. And uh, in terms of lifting um, for the first week, uh, I would not want them to lift more than five pounds for the first two weeks, actually. And then from week three to week six, I would not want them to lift more than 10 pounds. And then after week seven, they can go back to kind of their normal physical activity. Um, and then in terms of diet, um, they want to be on a full liquid diet uh, really for the first two weeks. Um, and then after that, for the next week, they can have like more of a puree diet and then uh, the next week, a softer diet. And the week after that, like a modified regular diet where they're avoiding um, breads and meat. And then on, on week six, um, they can they should be able to kind of resume their normal regular diet. So six weeks, pretty much they get back to back think, to normal. Yeah. What about um, we always get a lot of questions about exercising uh, when you know, I know heavy lifting, but there's questions. Can I go running? Can I do yoga? Can I do, you know, golf? Can I play golf? Right. Can they do those types of things right after they have the TIF procedure? I would wait at least a couple of weeks um, before doing those things. The reason is that you don't want to be increasing intra-abdominal pressure. When you do that, you have the potential of um, disrupting those fasteners that uh, we talked about. Um, and, and you just don't want to do that right after this. Um, so I would wait at least a couple of weeks um, uh, before engaging kind of heavy exercises. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, back to the questions. <laughs> um, what is the difference between GERD versus IBS? Um, so they're, yeah, they're vastly different conditions. Um, GERD, as we talked about, uh, again, is where the contents of your stomach reflux into your esophagus. Uh, and that just presents with heartburn and regurgitation, as we discussed. And IBS is a completely different uh, presentation clinically that involves more gas, bloating, abdominal discomfort, loose stools. Um, and that's that's a talk, a uh, different talk altogether. <laughs> different talk altogether. <laughs> okay. Um, Tara's asking, my reflux started after getting the lap band. Does it need to be removed? Um yeah, so I, I think that if you have a lap band, I mean, I, I would probably direct that question to more of the surgeon uh, that placed it and, and see what their thoughts on it, because I don't know how easily it can be removed. So I, I'd probably kind of defer that to, to the cardiothoracic surgeon. Okay, yeah. Okay, Everett's asking, I have GERD, IBD, and IBS, so diets overlap. Any suggestions on what I can eat that would be okay for all three, especially GERD, because I have daily pain in the esophagus? Yeah. Or person. I think, um, you know, with all those different conditions, he's got a lot of dietary restrictions. And um, we didn't touch upon this actually earlier, but, you know, him particularly, he should just focus on the restrictions uh, related to his other conditions uh, besides GERD because there's actually been no study um, that's shown that it, your GERD symptoms will improve if you avoid all the normal things that we talk about, spicy foods, fatty foods, um, coffee, soda, citrus juices. Um, so there's actually been no study that sh shows that if you avoid those things, your acid reflux is gonna, is gonna improve. But Having said that, if you find that there's a certain food trigger that definitely aggravates your symptoms, then by all means avoid that. Um, so in, in regards to his question, I would focus more on dietary modifications regarding IBS and IBD. Perfect. Okay, here's one. Um, from what I understand, PPI changes the micro, microbiome and neutralizes the good bacteria in the gut. It also affects the immunity, I have Barrett's esophagus and am on a PPI. What do you suggest to enhance the microbiome? Yeah, that that is something that has been um, you know looked at where you know PPIs long term can suppress acid, right? And so 
we need acid in our stomach to kind of kill all the bacteria that we're consuming every day. So if we have long-term acid suppression, um, all that bacteria that are, are entering our systems will then, you know, get into your small intestine uh, where they normally otherwise wouldn't have, and that can produce small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, so th that definitely is a concern, um, and that's why PPIs then have been kind of potentially linked to different enteric infections, um, C. diff, pneumonia, things of that nature. Um, so. In terms of improving the gut microbiome, um, that's again probably a different discussion, but that really um, revolves around mapping your gut microbiome and realizing where the imbalance is, and then uh, specifically replacing the bacteria that you know you lack. Um, I'm not uh, a fan of you know just giving everybody probiotics, so that again is a whole other discussion. <laughs> There's so many talks that you could do, <laughs> Dr. Vital. It's a very fascinating topic. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm taking a P Pat saying I'm taking a PPI twice a day. My absolute worst time is waking up every morning with a horrible sore throat, which continues throughout the day. This has been going on for 11 years and five GI doctors. What should I do? Oh. Um, yeah, then you definitely, I mean, I don't know what he's had done, but I mean, you need formal evaluation. This is exactly what I, we were talking about earlier, right? You have yeah. patients that have these symptoms and they've been on PPIs forever. Like we need to tailor our, our approaches uh, to each patient individually and personalize it. So, you know, I would want to gather data. I want to. I would want to get a pH study on this uh, individual and figure out exactly what's happening. Do you have acid reflux? Do you not? Do you have bile reflux? Do you have functional heartburn? And then treat it appropriately. Um, so my advice to him would be to get uh, a pH impedance study. Um, and uh, wherever he is, you know, um, I would I'd recommend he get that and then go from there. Yeah, maybe find a new GI that can, can do that for, for them. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, one last question and then we'll kind of conclude over here. What is the connection between GERD and belching and what is the solution for belching? That's an interesting question because I hear a lot of patients even after um, having the TIF procedure, they, they increase in belching. So, so what's your comment on that? <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I actually had a patient today um, that kind of presented um, with belching. Um, it, it it is part of the the you know symptomatology associated with this disorder of, of reflux disease, um, and it ha does not traditionally respond to PPI use. Um, belching, uh, there there is a medication called baclofen that I would recommend for that individual that um, does help with uh, belching uh, as well as a cough um, that is from um, reflux disease. Uh, but essentially, belching is just aerophasia, which basically means you have too much trapped air, um, and that air's got to come out. And so, you know, th that that's what belching, burping is. It's just a release of air. Um, so if you have increased intra-abdominal pressure um, and you're taking in carbonated beverages or, or, you know, foods that get fermented easily, then that air is going to get produced and then you can have um, belching that can occur. Okay, thank you. Okay, one last question, I promise. This is a good one. Uh, Dr. Patel, what would you tell patients who are worried about having a procedure during this time? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there that are worried. I mean, we're, we're having another rise, unfortunately, of COVID. And so, um, I would say that if you are having symptoms, uh, you're concerned about your symptoms, uh, and you need a procedure, then I think, um, you know, there are inherent risks. I mean, I, I can't deny that. Um, but at the same time, now is probably a safer time than ever in, in the sense that we are taking so many precautions for every procedure you, we get done, uh, we, we do for our patients. So every patient that comes in for a procedure needs to get COVID tested 72 hours in advance. They have to quarantine until they come in. And then every single person that comes through the hospital actually gets screened, um, you know, uh, and asked about their symptoms and their temperatures taken every day. Um, we're all wearing surgical masks. Um, and N95 mask uh, throughout the hospital. We're, we're social distancing. We're having gowns. So there's so many precautions that are being taken right now um, that you know it's 
in some ways a, a safer time um, to do it than when things get relaxed and we stop doing these things. So, right, right. Yeah. And are you currently um, at your practice doing tele telemedicine or telehealth? We are. Yeah, oh. we're doing um, you know a lot less than when you know COVID first hit back sure. in March and April. And uh, but um, absolutely, I'd probably do one or two televisits a day. Um, so yeah, it's okay. it's an option. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so to conclude, kind of, do you have? So how long have you been doing the TIF procedure now? Um, probably about, I would say like a year at this yep. point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, of those patients that you've tipped, if you will, um, what what has been the response, or you know, how how are they post op and and they're after they're recovered? Um, are they are they doing well? Um, kind of give us a. Do you have any patient stories that have been fantastic? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, majority of them have, uh, I would say. Um, and you know, it's the best thing is probably when I stop hearing from the patients um, because they're doing well. <laughs> you know, right. No reason for them to, to follow up. Um, but um, yeah, I, a lot of lot of good success uh, with TIF. Um, you know, uh, I, I usually keep my patients on PPIs um, even two, three weeks after TIF and then I take them off of it. And then it's just, it's really incredible to kind of have the patient follow up after that point and they're like, I've gone a month and I haven't had to use a PPI yet. And yeah. it's, it's really rewarding to kind of hear those stories uh, because it, this is such a, you know, a disturbance to a lot of people's quality of life. So to get that back, um, you know, is, is really awesome to, to be able to do that for people. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible uh, when I talk to a lot of these patients and, and hear their story, you know, their journey from years of taking PPIs or years of suffering. And then as soon as they're done, you know, they get the TIF procedure and like, I just don't have, I can eat. Like, right. it's, it's a world of difference. Um, yeah. It's amazing to hear these patients and to hear the stories. So, so. Yeah, I have classes now, but um, <laughs> not a great example, but I did think <laughs> uh, Yeah first came out right and like it was the coolest thing because I, I got the LASIK done and I had been classes my entire life and then you actually have to follow up the next morning when you do LASIK but yep. then you, you drove there without classes you wake yep. up and it was like the coolest thing you know yeah so it's kind of that feeling where you're like oh my god I don't have to take PPIs every day this is yeah great. Yeah. yeah and they you know it's it, they were pris imprisoned by it you know they couldn't even yeah. go out to eat or go on vacation if they forgot their tums or their PPIs, it was uh, they would have to go run and get it. It's it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. So, um, any last uh, uh, advice that you'd like to leave to um, the viewers that are watching um, and to anybody um, that may be considering, you know, the tip or any other type of anti reflex procedure. Yeah, I mean, I, what I would say is kind of what we um, harped on earlier is just this um, idea of, of personalized medicine. Um, really, you know, um, talk to your doctor, um, find a doctor that kind of takes that approach uh, and tailors the therapy towards you. So, you know, you have an idea of exactly what's what's happening with you and, and what the right treatment is because PPI is not the right treatment for everyone. Um, so you just need to know when it's used, when it's not, and when anti-reflux surgery is needed. Because uh, TIF is also not the right procedure for everyone. So it just has to be tailored towards the individual. Uh, and when you do that, that's when you get the best success. So personalized medicine is, is my uh, recommendation. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. And again, if you're you're located in Evanston, is that right? In Evanston okay. and also in Lincoln Park in Chicago. Okay, fantastic. So if any of you are watching and you're in the Chicago area, um, you can go visit uh, Dr. Patel. And I believe we have his phone number and address um, listed. So uh, please feel free to contact his, his office. They also do telehealth if that's something you're uh, more comfortable with, uh, especially for initial consults. Um, if you're not in the area, uh, you can visit GERDhelp.com. There is a physician finder there and you can type in your zip code and it, uh, you can find a physician um, that uh, offers the TIF procedure.
Um, again, Dr. Patel, we can't thank you enough for joining us this evening, um, taking the time to uh, discuss uh, GERD and personalized approach to GERD and also um, the TIF procedure. So thank you so much. And everybody that's watching, thank you for joining us and asking questions. And uh, we'll catch you next time on our next TIF Talk. So have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thanks, Andrea. It was fun. Thank you.